Transition Radio TV brought to you by TheBreastFormStore.com. They have everything you could possibly need for your cross-dressing and transgender needs. Visit their website at www.TheBreastFormStore.com and tell them Transition Radio sent you. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. The accident was over a year ago. A second woman has been elected president. A twelfth planet has been named in the solar system. The last wild polar bear has died. I slept through it all. Was here for my waking. He called it a beginning. He said it was good. I think he may have thought that anything I did was good. Welcome to Transition Radio, live from Milton Manors, Florida. With your host, Mark Angelo Cummings. And your hostess, Jessica Lane Cummings. Over trans folks, by trans folks, here to let your voice be heard. Good evening and welcome to Transition Radio TV show live yes. from Wilton Manor, Florida. Florida. It's Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want to thank everyone who is tuning in. We want to thank our chatters for being in the chat room. Yes. Please feel free to chat amongst yourself, ask questions, and we'll glance down and look at them and actually answer them for you or our guests will answer the questions that you are asking him. Absolutely. So, tonight... We have a very special guest, yes. Ryan Salins. He is a public speaker, diversity trainer, consultant, publisher, and author specializing in healthcare, campus inclusion, and workplace issues surrounding the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning community. Over the past 14 years, Ryan has conducted over 8,000 presentations and trainings to diverse audiences, including professionals, students, and the general public. After his appearance in the documentary, Gender Rebel, featured on the Logo channel. Ryan began traveling to universities where he shares a story of his transition from female to male. His story is told with an intermixing of humor and intricate clinical details surrounding the transition process. Ryan has also been interviewed twice on Larry King Live, Trisha, The New Ricky Lake Show, and on NPR's On Point with Tom Ashbrook. In 2012, Ryan released the first edition of his memoir, Second Son, Transitioning Toward My Destiny, Love and Life. In 2013, Ryan founded Scott Publishing LLC and released the second edition of his memoir, Second Son. Ryan attended the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he received a Bachelor of Arts in English and Anthropology, a Master of Arts in English, and a Master of Arts in the Educational Psychology. From the age of two, she wanted to be a he. I had a little Superman outfit, and there's a little dress, and I took the dress part off because I was not super yeah. girl or Superman. From intolerance and self-abuse, my family didn't understand it, so I just turned towards body hate and obsession. To finding his true identity. I finally felt like I was in my own skin. Ryan's story is next. Men who were born female. Today on Trisha. I want to move on to Ryan, who's sitting in the middle. Um, Ryan, uh, in your memoir, you've got a memoir out, Second Son. Now, you talk about the emotional ups and downs of ending up as, as Ryan. How difficult was it for you? Did, you? did you go through feeling first, as Rocco did, that you were a lesbian and then moving on from there? 
No, uh, you know, trans people, we have different stories. Yeah. And for me, it was difficult because I was born in Nebraska. And I still live in Nebraska, actually, which is still difficult. Uh, and I had no idea what anything was, be it gay, lesbian, transgender. I had a sense of my identity being different, or my gender being different around age two and a half. Really? Yeah, they say you have a sense of your gender identity, which is uh, what's between your ears, your brain. Your yeah, psychological yeah, sense yeah. of being man or woman. Uh, around 18 months, as early as 18 months. And then you start verbalizing it around age three or four. And how did you verbalize that? Uh, well, I didn't verbalize at that time. What I did was we lived in the country and we had a pool in our backyard. And I saw my family with swimming trunks and I saw my family in a one-piece bathing suit. And I had on a little two-piece. And with my little pudgy stomach, I looked down and I was like, meh. So I took the top off to be like swimming trunks. Yeah. Uh, and then I had a little Superman outfit and there's a little dress. And I took the dress part off because I was not super yeah. girl, I was Superman. So it was little behaviors like that that I started with. And so I was very frustrated with that. Yeah. I remember staying in a bathroom around age seven and just sitting there and thinking, I got dealt a bad deck of cards. Yeah. And I have to live with this the rest of my life. And this really sucks. And puberty must have been hell. Well, I don't think puberty is fun for anybody, but <laughs> it's, yeah, it's but... pretty horrific. Before people would look at me and they'd always confuse me for a little boy, which a part of me really liked, but a part of me still felt frustrated by that because, yeah. you know, I knew I was a girl. You yeah. Know, I didn't want to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then with puberty, you start seeing breast development, hip development, the menstrual cycle, all these things are just h horrific. How, uh, did, how did you deal with that? Did... Well, when I was little, I had this awareness of wanting to be a boy, and I'd go out in the stars and wish to become one. Oh. Um, and then when puberty hit, yeah. I knew that wasn't possible. I had to let go of that. So I just turned towards body hate and obsession. And I saw some female bodybuilders on TV, and I was super impressed that they really didn't have any breasts because their pectoral muscles were so big. Ah. They didn't really have any body fat, and they were just, you know, really beefy. So did you diet? I was doing, yeah, lots of different behaviors and exercise, weightlifting, uh, anything that I could do. <laughs> Way living, yeah. So, and uh, did you you developed an eating disorder? I did. When I was in college, I became severely ill with anorexia, and I almost died from it. And this was what about keeping your body, trying to keep your body androgynous, having some control over the uncontrollable? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was about. I just knew I felt very awkward. Yeah. And when I was in college, it, it became even more awkward. And I was like, I need to change my body so that I fit in this society and that people will love me and accept me and find me attractive. And I thought I need to be skinny. And that's where the behaviors then took on. I didn't understand it was gender. I didn't understand until four years into therapy uh, when I started looking at sexuality. And that's, that's when it hit home. What about your family, friends and family? How did they deal with this? You, you mentioned being in Nebraska, I'm guessing right. a very conservative area yeah. where you said before, never mind transgender, gay or anything right. else was an issue. How did everyone around you react? Well, I don't think my parents would be like, oh, okay, I already knew, or that's good because you were a lousy lesbian, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I had that. Uh, my family didn't understand it. It was not a topic that they had ever seen or heard before. I'd say that my brother uh, was the most supportive person then. Yeah. Yeah. So, I always say if it wasn't for him, I don't know if I'd be here. Now, did you have surgery? I did. Uh, I did. Top, bottom? For me, I completed what some people say all the steps. However, I always say it's really up to the individual. Mm. Not everybody wants surgery, nor do they think they need it. But for me, I knew I needed it. And wow. how, how much are we talking about? Uh, over the past seven years, I've spent 40000 out of pocket. Yeah. yeah. How'd you pay for that? Uh, I worked three jobs, and I have really good credit, so I had really <laughs> great credit lines. <laughs> yeah. The big thing, yeah. <laughs> And now welcome to our show, Mr. Ryan Salins. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. That was a, a very interesting interview. Um, yes. It, it's like if you look at all these different interviews, they all ask around the same type of questions. And it's, it's such a like, ooh, ah type of thing. And it, but we're making headways. And it's, it's good to have people understand us by being on these shows. So definitely. Yes. Anyway. In your wildest dreams, did you ever think you would be where you are today? And are you happy? Well, I can definitely say that, uh, no, not in my wildest dreams did I ever think that, one, I would transition, and two, I'd become a national speaker, and three, I'd write books. No, absolutely not. But um, I can definitely say I'm very grateful for the journey that I've gone on because I've learned so much about life and the value of relationships and the value of just being who we are, not what other people want us to be. So as far as being happy, you know, 
I'm writing a new book, and I kind of talk a little bit about this. As, um, I have moments where I'm really happy, but emotions cycle. So then I have other moments where I kind of curl up in a corner and ask myself why I continue doing what I'm doing. You know, I question if I'm relevant anymore in this world. So I definitely see cycles in that, but there's definitely happiness there. And that's very interesting you say that because most people think that all of a sudden the magic wand is going to get waved and the happiness is just going to come in once you transition. It's like all the problems are going to be gone. And most people don't realize that it doesn't happen that way. A lot of times, and I've seen people after transitioning, they kind of question what they did. And it's like, do you really feel complete or was it all worth doing? I think the way I feel, it's like one should be happy no matter what. And that you do this because you want to, but not to find happiness. Now, if you don't mind me asking, why do you feel those moments of unhappiness? If you don't mind sharing well, with us. Well, you know, um, I think I struggle with depression here and there. And so a transition is not going to take away that depression. Um, and so I am, um, you know, it gets me here and there. And I think it's hard when you are a public speaker or seen as a public figure because people can... Um, start attacking you, uh, whether it's because of their own envy or jealousy, or they completely misconstrue something said. And so you're attacked, and it's hard uh, having that happen. We could definitely yeah, relate with that. Definitely. Because we've, not only from our own community, and we've received a lot of that from our own community, but also from people outside of the community every time we've been in media or any kind of Exactly. publication or anything like that and and it does it does get to you but you have to kind of like shake it off and realize what the goal is well, you know mark can tell you too how you said about like the emotional ups downs and backs and forths uh you know transition doesn't take it all away i have days that i feel like i'm going backwards my oh my god my boobs shrunk uh uh you know oh god you know i i, I feel like a caveman what the hell is going on you know and then other days i feel very feminine and very beautiful and then there's other days i'm just like Ugh, why did i get out of bed <laughs> I it's kind of fascinating how kind of emotions uh, our emotions can be played out in our physical bodies and how we feel that we present physically. So. Yeah, I believe so. But I think Absolutely. by, with me using my creative energy, doing things that make me happy, whether it's music, whether it's putting these shows together, just whatever it is that's creative keeps me focused and keeps me happy. If I find myself not being creative, that's when I get the depression. Or if I find myself not feeling worthy of what I'm doing, then I, I find the depression. You but, not be creative. Huh? I said you not be creative. Well, I mean, there are times... You're always where, being creative. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> do you find that, that when you find yourself doing creative things, you feel better and more focused? I think that any time in the space where I'm able to write, I feel better. Uh, unfortunately, my music has gone to the wayside over the past nine years, so I, have, I need to get back into that at some point, but finding the time is going to be hard. But also when I do public speaking, I get a huge surge of energy because I meet so many amazing people. Um, just amazing people with amazing stories. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's, the, you, it's almost like a give and take. You feed off their energy and they feed off of yours and it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, Ryan, you went all the way to Belgrade, Serbia to get your lower surgery. How was that experience for you? And do you recommend this to other trans men who are debating between a fallow versus a metatoplasty? Well, I, as far as recommending to other trans guys, I always say you need to make the decisions for yourself as what's going to be the best option. You know, for me, I spent three years um, researching surgeons and techniques and outcomes. And consistently, the Belgrade team for me came out as a team I wanted to go to. So it was definitely a journey and a little bit different than what you would see here in the States as far as healthcare practices, but they were an amazing team. And at this point, I'm happy that I chose metoyoplasty. You know, in the future, maybe I'll say to myself, oh, maybe it's time to move on to the fallow. But right now, the metoidio works and it does what I need to do. And that's all that really matters. I want to ask you, because I mean, I looked into it myself back in the day, and I guess what held me back was all 
the complications, the pain, and looking at certain videos, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to put myself through that. How was that experience? Was it a painful? Was it, I mean, give us a little detail on how it went for you, if you don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, some guys will say, oh, it was fine. All the painful, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, what drugs were you on? <laughs> <laughs> it was, seriously, the metoloplasty was the most painful thing I've ever done in my life. And that was mainly because of the um, the implants, the silicone implants that they put into the scrotum. They, it's swollen. It hurts. You walk like a cowboy for about a year. You know, just really adjusting to that was difficult. And I heard that many guys have problems with uh, fistulas as well. Right. So this is... If you do a urethral extension where they create urethra and uh, attach it to your old so you can pee through your penis, there's lots of risks to that. And that's one of the reasons why I chose the Belgrade team is because they are microsurgeons that specialize in pediatric urology. So I felt that I had the best chance with them. And I was very fortunate where I didn't have any strictures. And this tiny fistula I had was cured with uh, some antibiotics. Wow. Yeah. See, all that kept me away, and I was like, I'm too much of a weenie, and looking at these surgeries, I'm like, oh, my God, heck no. How do you sit? How do you, you We were know? just looking at those the other day. I know. We were looking at the MTF uh, vaginoplasty, and we were looking at the uh, phalloplasty for the FTMs, and it was just like... Ugh. Watching a horror film, I'm like, hell no. I'm not going through well, that. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, just understanding that you're asleep when they're doing the surgery part, you know, and, and the God. healing process is pretty amazing how you're able to be in that moment uh, and really normalize what's going on with your body while it's healing with the stitches or any health problems that you have. So I think the hardest thing with surgeries is that mental aspect yeah. and the preparation um, and being able to just sit and heal and not move around for a couple of months. That's really one of the hardest parts. Yeah. And I know how that goes because I had my uh, top surgery along with my hysterectomy at the same time. It was a seven-hour procedure. I figure, do or die. After going through that, and then that's why it became really difficult to do the other. I'm like, I think I've had enough of surgery. I don't want any more. Yeah, when I when I did the or when I went to and I had my orky, it was like almost uh, about a week. I was pretty much immobile, yeah. and I could I had to sleep on my back for almost two weeks because I couldn't move because they took everything in my pelvic area out on top of you know my testicles. So it's like <gasps> now that we scared everybody away from having surgery. <laughs> There's, you know, if people are looking at it, there's great surgeons, and it's really great that they'll do consultations with you. And if you go to the conferences, like the Philadelphia Trans Health Conference or uh, Gender Odyssey or First Event Boston, the, the surgeons are there, so you can sit there and meet with them, and they'll, they'll take care of you. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, let's change gears here a little bit. It really amazes me how our stories are so much alike as transgender men in general. Talk to us about your eating disorder. I know I had major eating disorders and was also into bodybuilding and the whole nine yards. And um, let's see, and has, have, has that changed since your transition, your eating disorders? And right. Well, as far as behaviors go, yes, that I, I no longer engage in disordered eating behaviors. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is that eating disorders are a mental illness, so they can't be cured. Um, I struggle with the term eating disorder because really I feel it's more about your feelings uh, and acting out your feelings through food or abusing your body. And so I just recognize that when my, um, when my thoughts start going to a place where I start attacking my body or my body parts or picking myself apart, it's because I'm either experiencing a lot of fear, sadness, or anxiety. And so now when I have those moments, I, ask, I take a step back and say, um, you yeah, know, what's going on? What are you feeling? Let's explore this. Okay. I'm looking at the chat room. Somebody tried calling. I guess something happened that Joe just wrote, whoever called, please call back. So, uh, please call back. And Joe, if you put up the number up, I don't know if you, cause I don't have it. You it's usually... on the bottom right hand corner of the screen on the live. Okay. Oh, it's probably cause we're, yeah, covering, we're covering it up with our thing. But if you guys call back, uh, we'll definitely take in your calls <laughs> and, uh, so will they do that? Absolutely. So yeah, definitely. I, I 
the eating, uh, and I know you don't like to call it disorder, but I went through anorexia, bulimia. Then it was just all about trying to get myself into shape. Uh, I was pretty overweight when I was uh, female bodied and just food was my comfort. And thank God uh, I don't have that problem anymore. I know when to stop. Food doesn't have a hold on me any longer. So, mm-hmm. And okay. I don't have that obsession about the stomach. When I was a female, I used my stomach just like, it was always almost like an irritable bowel syndrome that I suffered from. Mm-hmm. I'm a good cook, so he, has, he better not have any complaints in that department. No, I don't. <laughs> so, Ryan, you are an amazing speaker and have had your share of speaking engagements. What is your mission statement as you pursue to educate the world on transgender issues? Um, I think the main thing is to have accountability and recognize that when people bring me in, whether it's an organization, agency, school, they're looking to me for information. Uh, and this could be information that they then take on to create change. And so I hold myself accountable and am very dedicated to always seeking new information, attending conferences, uh, consulting with people that do this work so that I can give, um, you know, the broadest spectrum that I can that's that's accurate. Awesome. Excellent. What actually what actually enticed you to do your advocating work? You know, to get into speaking and public speaking. You know, I've I've been a public speaker since I was a little kid. Um, I was in 4-H and I did this the the speech contest and one year I won and that was really exciting and then I got involved in the public speaking things at our school. Uh, and then college, I moved into peer education, and I started being a coordinator and writing scripts. And then I was a graduate assistant helping the sexuality uh, education department. And then I was hired as a health educator and sexuality educator for a nonprofit reproductive health center. So it's just been something I've always done. Uh, education is part of my passion. Um, being trans was just kind of a nice little piece of the go right in there, you know, having that personal experience along with the professional background and knowledge. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. So tell us, how difficult was it coming out of your family, and were they receptive? It, well, <laughs> it was, I think, coming out to be difficult for a lot of people, and, and it was the same for me. Uh, the first person I came out to was my brother, and he was actually very open and accepting, but also very scared. Uh, we live in the state where Brandon Tina was murdered, uh, and his story was documented in the movie Boys Don't Cry with Hillary Swank in it. So my brother feared for my safety. And he feared for w- what would happen with his own family because they still live in my hometown. And I, lived in, I grew up in a very small town in Nebraska. Uh, coming out to my parents, they weren't as receptive. It, it was very difficult. Uh, I felt disowned from my dad for about six months. And... Really, it just took patience with them and letting them have their fears and their anger and process it and reminding myself that whatever they're saying, it's not about me. It's their own stuff and it's their own fear. They're just tossing it at me. It that is me so that true. Object. Definitely. Exactly. Ryan, we have a caller on the line. Uh, caller? Hi. Hey. This is, is... This is Jesse. My, my name's Jesse and I'm from North Dakota. And I've admired you, Ryan, for, um, I think, for the past few months now. You're from a small town north. I'm, you're from, you know, Midwest, rural, small town. And I'm from small town North Dakota. And the thing, the, you know, the only resources that I have, really, as a, as a transgender, is the Internet. Mm-hmm. So I look, you know, on YouTube, the before and after of trans men. And I, and I watched these things, and I just, you know, I just want to share a story. It's not so much a question, but as I was watching these before and after videos, it made me wonder, like, this is giving me the idea that the only way I'll ever be happy is if I do that, you know, take hormones or get top surgery. And so I did more research, you know, I'm still a man, even if I don't take hormones, because honestly, in North Dakota, there's no resources for me to go through with something like that. So it's... It's hard to keep, you know, peace with myself that I can't, you know, change now because school is more of a priority for me. Does that make sense? So in, in, your, in both you guys, you guys are both, you know, trans men. Am I less of a man because I'm not, because I don't have facial hair? Mm. 
No, no, absolutely not. Um, I don't know if Mark, if you want to go first. Um, I've always said there's no such thing as trans enough. And being trans is in your heart. It's not the surgeries that you do. It's not the hormones that you take. Transgender individuals have been around forever, before the surgery, before the hormones. What was the, the fighter who, uh, Joan of Arc, very much so uh, expressed her, himself, because I, I believe that he saw himself as a he. So you are just as much of a man as myself, as Ryan, as Joe, the producer of the show. Don't ever feel any less because you can't do the things that exactly. you would want to do. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, the other thing I would add is that if you're feeling a loss of hope because you don't think there's any resources around, um, lots of times on my Facebook, I'll just send out request say hey does anybody know any trans friendly pro- providers near this region and i usually get at least one provider so it could be a step to finding something even if you feel there's nothing there for you exactly yeah. and i can say for my from my experience as a trans woman that <clears throat> basically um the holding off because of another priority um you know i put off transition several times before I finally took that step to say, boom, I'm doing this. I have to, I have no choice. And then I finally took the steps to venture into it. Right. And there are, there are ways of doing that natural transition. There's a, a trans guy by the name of Tristan Sky. He started off doing it naturally by taking supplements that will help improve your um, and androgen level. And also by working out, just doing things that make you feel more manly, that makes you feel at home. You, we do have links on our website that has providers you might be able to find nearby provider in your area. Yeah. But never give up hope and never think of yourself any less. You are who you are. Exactly. Thanks, guys. You're very welcome. Awesome. the work that you do. Thank Facebook you. me. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And do the same with us. Yes. And visit our website and go do that good stuff. All right, so we have a little video here of uh, you giving information on how to come out to your family. So we wanted to share this with the viewers. The most common question that I get asked is, Ryan, when is it the right time for me to come out to my family with my transgender identity? And I think this is a great question and one that I have three rules for. The first one is when you are ready. All right, it's not for me to decide. It's not for other people to decide. You really need to gauge your own readiness to come out to family. Some people feel pressured by other people, but you just have to push that pressure away because they are not in your situation and they don't know what you're exactly going through. Some things that you can use to gauge your readiness for this uh, is if you are obsessing about it. If you are around your family and you feel like you really want to share, you can kind of feel it bubbling up in your chest, uh, but you get too scared to do it. That could be a sign that you're ready to move forward in it. Uh, But before you move forward, my second rule is, do you have a support system or have a support system? Uh, This would be talking to a good friend that you can trust. This would be a distant family member that you know either identifies as LGBT or is supportive of LGBT issues. Or it could be a teacher uh, that's supportive of you and can provide you with a safe space. Right now we have 40% of youth that are homeless on the streets identifying as LGBT and the number one reason for that is family rejection. So having a support system before coming out is a very important step. And then the third rule is come out. Once you feel ready and once you have your support system in place, it's time to move forward. I know that it can be scary and you still have all those what ifs and other questions bouncing around in you, but when you come out to your family, it allows that energy to move forward for both of you, for all of you. It allows them to start dealing with this issue, dealing with it in their own way, being able to start asking questions. Some family members may take this news very well. Other family members may be very scared, confused, and sadly there are some family members that will be very hateful or demeaning towards you. The important thing to remember is if there is someone that's being demeaning towards you or saying derogatory things, that's their own stuff that they're dealing with. That's not you. And that's not what your identity stands for. So when you hear it, try to have it just bounce off your skin instead of letting it penetrate you because that's their own issues. And hopefully over time, when they see how happy you are and you're moving forward as a healthy human being, they can let their own issues go. And no, again, it can be scary, but I know you can do it. And good luck on your coming out process. That was awesome. Great advice. Great, great Thanks. advice. 
definitely. So you're, you're from Nebraska. How is the trans community received there, and do you do much advocating there locally? Um, we have a very large trans community in Nebraska, and uh, a lot of different support groups that are popping up in different regions there. Um, and so, you know, we still struggle with discrimination, uh, whether it be in housing or it be in the workplace. Uh, we still struggle with finding support locally if you're in a rural area, but I think more and more it positive changes are happening for, for people here. Um, when I first started doing work through the nonprofit that I worked for, I did a lot of advocating for the local community. Uh, I've moved a little bit more into national work now, being self-employed, but I still am part of a, um, a group called Professional Transgender Resource Network in Nebraska, and we're a multidisciplinary group of professionals that are working to advocate uh, be, change policy and educate other providers here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, I find a lot of times the professional community out there, they need the words and advice from us to even know how to deal with us or those like us. Definitely. I mean, even like back in the day when I transitioned in 2003, the doctors didn't have much information. So I started doing a lot of the seminars to educate the nurses and the doctors to learn how to deal with us. And I had a, my uh, general practitioner, the one who actually gave me the hormones, she had no clue. So I had to give her all the information. Yeah. So I believe we are the teachers and definitely need to help out. Absolutely. Well, we have a video clip that we want to show everyone. It's one man's story of being transgender. I have early memories of identifying as a male, but I didn't understand what it meant. A controversial subject that many here in Nebraska don't discuss. Our top story, what it's like to be transgender and live in Nebraska. You may have heard of the Brandon Tina story and the movie Boys Don't Cry. Recently, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals denied an appeal by one of the teen's killers. Good evening, I'm Bridget Fargin. Owen Jensen is off tonight. Now, many of you left comments on our website about a lack of awareness for transgender issues in the state, so we decided to work to change that. In a special report, 1011's Bonnie Bowman brings us the story of a Nebraska man who started life in a woman's body and how he struggled for acceptance. Looking at these pictures, you may not see Ryan Salins, but he sees himself as he started life. A daughter and a sister, now a son and a brother. It's an identity that started to form when he was very young. My dad and my brother would be in swimming trunks, and I would see that, and my mom always put me a little two-piece when I was little, and so I always took the top off, because I wanted to be like my dad and my brother. Uh, so I have early memories of identifying as a male, but I didn't understand what it meant. Described as a tomboy when he was little, Ryan was teased as a teen and struggled to develop in a gender he couldn't connect with. Body image issues led to severe battles with anorexia and bulimia, but it was in his recovery in therapy that Ryan first started to find who he was. My first step in looking at sexuality was uh, admitting to myself that I had a true attraction to women, and I was scared of that too because I was scared of the label lesbian because when you hear the term lesbian, you think two women together, and I did not feel like a woman. I didn't understand what that meant, but I didn't feel like that. When he was 24, while browsing in the transgender section of a bookstore, the pieces of Ryan's puzzle fell into place. And I saw all these pictures, and I knew that was me. I just knew it. everything that I struggled with clicked into place. And five months later, I began my transition. He describes that time as exhilarating but scary, with his full transition taking three years. Psychotherapist Megan Smith says many of her trans patients focus on others' reactions. Usually a lot of our sessions are around how other people are going to cope. Um, and then in relation, how are they going to cope with other people's reactions? My dad refused to talk to me. Um, that's his way to deal with things that are really hard that he doesn't understand he's scared of. He just kind of shuts it out. So for six months, I didn't talk to him at all. And he removed all my pictures off the walls and all my stuff out of the house. It took four years for Ryan's parents to start using his new name and the male pronoun. Do I think that they totally accept me and want to be a part of my life? No. Um, I, I just, I don't think it's ever going to be possible. The suicide and depression rates in the trans community are very high. Smith says that's because there's still such a stigma attached to being transgender. If you are isolated or if, if you have been rejected or have been ostracized by your community, your religious institutions, your schools, your family, um, that can be a really lonely place. 
a really lonely place to be. There's also a lot of fear. Nebraska doesn't have non-discrimination laws protecting gender identity or sexual orientation. A lot of people live with the fear that they're going to lose their job uh, or that they're not going to get hired for a job um, or they're going to be denied housing because of their trans identity. And depending on where they live, some transgender Nebraskans may struggle with access to both physical and mental health care. We definitely have um, some great doctors and great therapists here in Nebraska. We have some great support groups, um, but it, it's very limited. Ryan says in the future, he'd like to see more resources for transgender residents and their families so others can become the person they feel on the inside, just like he did. I feel like my struggles with depression, I feel like my struggles with the eating disorder were all outward signs of me trying to deny who I was. It's pretty amazing what happens when you honor what's real inside of you that you're scared of. Reporting in Omaha, Bonnie Bowman, 1011 News. Very interesting. Another long speech, yeah, definitely. I had a hard time. That's why I put so many of your vids because I usually pick three, but they're all so good. I'm like, I'm just going to put them all in there. <laughs> I guess I was very impressed by uh, the work that they did on that video. So was I. Yeah. They did it in a very positive very light, which is good, which a lot of media outlets are starting to do, whereas they yeah. didn't do it before. Yeah. Well, we've had pretty good luck with the yeah. media outlets that we've been on, and they've been pretty respectful. And Absolutely. Unlike in the beginning, back in the day when I started, and Maury Povich asked me what was below my belt, I was like, dude, again, do I ask you what's below your belt? I mean, that was like totally floored, and to me it was very rude and kind of put a bad taste in my mouth, but times are changing. Absolutely. I was really curious on um, your intra or subcutaneous shots that you're taking versus the intramuscular. I've been doing intramuscular since I started back in 2003, and you switched after being on the intramuscular to subcutaneous for eight years. Have you noticed any changes, and what got you to, to change? Okay. <laughs> kind of funny that you asked that because I've actually switched back to intramuscular shots. Um, <laughs> okay. I, but I, I'll talk about how it could be good for people to get on subcutaneous shots. All right. Um, so people, providers are looking at subcutaneous shots and saying, hey, there's a lot of advantages to this because um, we're not going to be looking at the development of scar tissue because you're no longer going to be putting the, the needle into your thigh or into your muscle. Uh, we may be able to have more regular dose which decreases the peaks and valleys when you're on hormones and your, and your uh, mood changes. Um, and you use a smaller needle, so that'd be great, right? And so I think there's a lot of advantages to subcutaneous shots. And if you have a provider that is interested in starting on it, definitely check it out and see if it's right for you. Uh, I tried it. I was on it for th about three months, and I became extremely depressed. Uh, I struggle a lot with anxiety, and I just didn't feel like myself. And so my provider and I tried to work on a different dose and different days and doing different things, and nothing was helping. Um, I also got a lot of bumps underneath my skin from where I had injected. So I just decided to switch back to intramuscular shots, and I actually just did a video today that's posted on my YouTube channel of a new technique that I found with intramuscular shots where I don't feel any pain. I don't feel any pain whatsoever, and then I don't have any soreness in my leg after I do it, even the next day. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Ryan, can you explain to everybody the difference between intramuscular and subcutaneous well, for the people that may not know? There's going to be a video. Yeah, that. but you can explain okay. it too, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, the subcutaneous is you, you'd be injecting uh, into your fat or your adipose tissue, all right? So you're going underneath your skin. Uh, intramuscular shot, you're going into your muscle. And so you're releasing that oil and that compound into the muscle instead of into your adipose tissue. Right. Gotcha. Okay. And the reason I didn't ask you that because there's a video. You <laughs> explain the whole thing in a video that's coming. Well, that's out. okay. That's my blonde girl. I wanted to know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's a little video uh, you explaining about subcutaneous versus intramuscular. Hello, everyone. For the past eight and a half years, I've been doing intramuscular uh, injections into my thigh to administer my testosterone. So every 10 days, and I have videos on this, every 10 days I would switch thighs and inject my testosterone. Um, three months ago I switched to what's called subcutaneous injections. Subcutaneous injections mean instead of injecting into your muscle, you're injecting into your subcutaneous tissue. 
when I first started on hormones, uh, many providers said, don't do subcutaneous shots because your body's not going to be able to use the hormone. It's just going to filter it through so you don't get the full effect of, like for my case, the testosterone. Now, providers and researchers are saying, hey, from the research that we've done, we're seeing that subcutaneous shots are safe, effective, and that your body is utilizing the hormone that you inject into it. With the extra advantages of you're using a smaller needle in size and girth, you are no longer having to worry about scar tissue development in your muscle because you're not doing those shots anymore, which is really important, especially for people starting on hormones at a young age and continuing for the rest of your life. That risk for scar tissue is pretty high in that sense. They can be less painful as well. However, I will say for me with subcutaneous shots, uh, currently I have found that they've been pretty painful, uh, meaning that right after I do an injection, it stings and burns for about a minute or two, and then it's a little bit bruised for the next few days. Uh, something to help with that is maybe your injection site. So today I'm going to demonstrate on my abdomen, which is where I've been doing it, just because it's going to be easier for the camera. But a lot of providers say, hey, instead of doing it in your abdomen, switch to the outer um, interior side of your thigh, like you've been doing with your IM shots, and inject there, so maybe you're not going to have as much problems with the stinging and pain there. Other providers say, hey, if that still doesn't work, maybe it's just the oil that your testosterone is suspended in. So if you're using sesame oil, which most of us do because cottonseed is more expensive, maybe try using cottonseed to see if that helps. Uh, so for me, the pain's a little bit still there. Uh, others say they don't feel anything and they love these shots. All right. The other great thing about subcutaneous is that you're doing it more frequently because it does go through your body a little bit faster than if you're doing an intramuscular shot. And with doing it more frequently, it may reduce kind of your peaks and valleys uh, and give you more of a steady dose of hormones to help you with your energy, your mood, um, and other things that are affected by hormones. So with the injection, you want to stay two inches away from your a belly button or umbilical area. All right, so you say two inches away, and from the different things I've researched within this region is where you'd be injecting. Uh, I have a higher belly button, so I'm gonna be going lower. Um, and I've already did my right side because you wanna alternate each size each day or each time you do it. And so you grab the new technique I'm starting to use, you grab your tissue and squeeze it like this, and then you take the needle and you go directly in. All right, directly in, straight in, inject and then pull out okay and then you massage for two minutes another technique that i first tried that my provider showed me but i decided i didn't like it as much is you stretch the skin and you take the needle and you put it underneath and have that doubled in going underneath that tissue and then inject all right so then it'd be going in like that uh, but this way pinching works better for me okay i'm not going to show you how to load the needle because i think there's plenty of videos that show that and i already have videos that show that so if you want to look at that you can at a later time. So I have my needle here and I have a little bit of a, um, the bigger end on it. I have a 22 gauge right now because I just haven't got a new prescription which means I haven't got the 25 gauge yet. But the thing with this is you can still use them you just don't push it all the way in. Okay so as you can see I have the tissue here And just go directly in. Okay, and then slowly inject it. Okay, slowly take it out and massage it. If you do it for about a couple minutes, that really helps with the dispersing of the oil. Um, and that's really all there is. To the that's um. I was going to ask you because usually like growth hormone or even insulin, you use a smaller needle and you do it subcutaneously. I was going to ask you, how do you draw? Because the other, I think it's a 28 gauge, they're very small, very, very small. And I was going to ask you, you must have a heck of a time trying to draw. But I, well, you, I see that you're using a 25 or a 23. Yeah. Well, if you're drawing the oil out or the testosterone out, you're still going to use the 18 gauge that okay. it, you come with that you switch, that you switch right, to right. the... 25 yeah. or 22. Okay. You had yeah. something else that you wanted to Yeah. Um, actually, when you said about the differences, uh, like with MTFs, uh, the differences is we have intramuscular or we have oral. 
and you know they it's a lot of time like in Florida it was hard for me to find a doctor that would prescribe the injectable the intermuscular oh because you know it was one excuse or another and I did research and I found out that actually the intramuscular for the MTFs is better because a you absorb more of the estrogen well, yeah. Then you do filler like you do with orals. You get maybe 30% estrogen with the orals as opposed to uh, 70%, approximately 70% of estrogen with the intramuscular. Well, anytime so, you do anything injectable, you're going to get more. But this is two different kind of injectables. One, you're injecting to the muscle and the other, you're injecting to right, the fat. Right, right. But with the fat, I, I would see that the body would not absorb it as good as if you do it in the muscle. In the muscle, it's almost like a slow release and it'll last longer. Yes. So it is, it's, yeah. it'll last 10 to 14 days with the IM shot. And they usually say between seven to 10 days with a sub Q, but, um, okay. see a lot of providers switching to it. Yeah. I still like, uh, the intramuscular. I, I mean, that's what I've been doing forever. Right. And I always say what works for you is what you should yes, do. <laughs> so. Definitely. Definitely. If it's not broke, don't fix don't it. Fix it. I don't know. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your many projects, your memoir, Second Son, and Scott Publishing. Yeah. Uh, well, the second edition will be released to the public uh, starting December 11th, hopefully. Everything goes right with the printing and it gets to the distributor in time. You thought I have copies for sale on my website, but going into the stores and everything will happen December 11th. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, I started Scott Publishing because... I felt that I wanted to have another challenge in life, and it's definitely a challenge. Um, and so I um, have signed on two other authors, and we're going to be releasing their books next year. Uh, and our goal is to just share stories of triumph and challenge. And it doesn't have to be LGBT specific, even though I love having LGBT books. And the two books that are coming out are going to be LGBT books. But I just want to have stories shared. And we're also going to be doing that through the Outrider Review, which you see up on the screen right now. That's going to be a quarterly literary journal that's going to have art, photography, poetry, nonfiction, um, fiction, sharing stories of sexuality, gender, and identity. And it doesn't have to be LGBT again. I don't want just to be LGBT. I want to have all of our communities join together and sharing our stories and talking about things here that oftentimes in the U.S. we're not allowed to talk about or he feels shamed about talking about it it's an awesome project that you yeah, uh, like are that. doing there definitely as a transgender man i know too well the need to lead a healthy lifestyle and having a workout routine share with our viewers how you stay in shape and how important is it to you uh well i've learned in life the importance of moderation and so i stay in shape by just doing moderate exercises three four or five times a week uh, I know that when I don't work out, I start having more anxiety and feeling more depressed. So it's really important for me to just set some time away where I step away from the computer, away from my phone, away from emails, and uh, sweat a little bit. So, you know, I do P90X here and there. I do Insanity here and there. I uh, just run on the roads when it's not 14 degrees outside. So whatever <laughs> just feels good that day is what I do. And definitely is important. I don't. I used to be a exercise fanatic, um, especially in my bodybuilding days. And that again was that whole dealing with the uh, gender dysphoria. But now I just do maybe twenty minutes, four or five times a week. I have my own little workout room, and I'm not as obsessed about right. it. And, you know, and it's it's happy medium. I think balance is something we're here to learn as human beings to do, and. Whichever part of the pendulum, if you go too much to the extreme or not at all, it's kind of bad either way. So you have to try to find that happy medium and what works for you. Right. I do have a video that I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you talk about muscle building. So, Hey, folks. Uh, Ryan Sounds here. Uh, I'm a trans man. Me and I was born assigned female and transitioned to male. And some of you may know me from all my other YouTube videos. Others may just be introduced to me. Uh, one of the areas that I like to focus on, and one of the areas I'm very passionate about, is fitness. Uh, I just recently, just within the past couple of minutes, finished my workout routine for today. Uh, and for the past month and a half now, I've been just working out in my basement with a few items. Mainly because I had a really bad back injury last year, and I just can't recover from it. 
uh, many chiropractic visits later and everything. It's just taking time. So I decided to quit my gym because I was just hurting myself there. And I'm getting older. So even if I took all the proper weightlifting classes as a younger kid, your body ages and it changes. Especially after you hit 30, it goes down after that, just so you know. Uh, so I'm starting to do stuff in my basement, and I just kind of had the idea, you know, lots of other people are really interested in working out, but either one, they can't afford a gym membership, or two, they don't really want to be around people in the gym. Uh, lots of people contact me and ask me about my upper body and what I've done for workouts, especially trans guys. A lot of people are really interested in developing the pectoral muscles. And I always say that there's two things that you need uh, to do that. One would be pull-ups, and the second thing would be push-ups. Those are the two best exercises for both resistance, weight-bearing, and to have a more complete body workout throughout your core, your arms, your back, uh, your biceps and triceps. It's pretty amazing. So options for pull-ups. For me, I ended up going to a sports store here in town and buying an $18 chin-up bar. All right? It's just a straight bar. Uh, and then what I did, I think you can see it here, I took a couple pieces of wood, screwed the... Uh, little support seam, seams in there and then took those pieces of wood and drilled five screws deep into the rafters. So now it's just hanging. And as you can tell, it supports my 170 pounds, no problem. And the great thing about push-ups, or pull-ups I should say, so you can do the wide grip, get them out super wide, you can do standard, you can do chin-ups, great for the biceps, especially if you hold it there for a while, or you can do closed grip pull-ups, all right? Great workout. You pound out three, four, five sets of these, 10 each or more, you're gonna start seeing something pretty quick as far as effects. So you may say though, you know what? I can't afford to uh, put anything into my rafters because I don't have rafters or I don't have a basement or I can't drill into anything. There's two other options that you could have. One of them would be something like this. This is called an iron gym, all right? So this part goes on one side of the door, then you loop it inside, and this part sits on the other side of the door frame. Uh, this is really great for um, newer homes. I actually bought this because the first ant one drilled into my rafters, but I discovered that this does not fit into old home door frames, so kind of a waste of money for me. Uh, these run about $25 to $35 in stores or online. Then one other option, if you don't have either of those that you can use, or you don't have $25, $35, is you can get resistant bands, all right? These bands right here. And the great thing about this is you see this little thing, you loop in how, many, how much resistance you want, you put that over a door, close the door, there's a little thing here that catches, and then you have bars. So you can use these to pull for pull-ups if you're sitting down get a good angle. You can use them for doing other exercises as well. There's usually instructions that come with these. And these range between $11 to $19 online or in store. So this is another option. Uh, working out doesn't have to be expensive. Just like eating healthy does not have to be expensive if you know what to do, which I'll do some videos on eating healthy as well. Uh, and then as far as push-ups, you can do your standard length. You can do military push-ups, which are close. You can do dining push-ups, where you're doing them with your chest. Or you can do decline push-ups, where you put your feet up on a chair and they get deeper depth. Those are the hardest for me. Declines and these, whew, they're killer. Uh, and then after you're done, you can look in the mirror and say, yeah, all right, working out's working for me. I'm gonna keep doing it. So there's your tips for today. And I'll have more in the future for wellness and working out on a budget. All right, bye. Excellent wow. advice. I gotta say, I gotta say, UFTMs, I swear, you guys, get better bodies than most genetic men. Yeah. <laughs> not because you're biased or anything. No, <laughs> no, no exactly. not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, working out is important. I mean, no, but yeah. I was sweating there a little bit watching that. So. No, she doesn't work out. I try to get her lure in our workout room, but she doesn't like to. Yes, but I'll let her. Yeah, all right. Okay. Then, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> that will fade as you get older. You're Shut 30, up! You're 39 now. <laughs> It's important. I, I like it. I enjoy it. And I, uh, like I said, I have my own little room there with a bench and a gold gym universal. And I do the little thing with the pull-ups and, you know, I'm turning 50. So you got to try to stay in shape. There's a caller on the line, Absolutely. according to what Joe uh, posted here. Do we still have that caller, Joe? Hello. Hello, caller. Tell us your name and where you're yeah, calling hi. from. 
Hey, hello, guys. Hey, what's what? Where are you calling from, and what's your name? Hi, oh, this is Kate O'Malley from Florida. Oh, up in Gainesville. Gainesville, that's uh, awesome. Yes, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you both, you three, for especially at the top of the show where you were talking about doubts and fears and even after all you've gone through, and uh, I know I experienced that myself as a as a trans woman, and I sit here and I think, am I the only one who's afraid that I've made a big mistake? And it's it's reassuring to know that I'm not the only one alone out here having my doubts, but also loving the life that I'm living. So I just wanted to call and thank you guys so much for, for including that in your discussion. Thank you. Thank you for watching thank and you. thank you for your call. We appreciate it. Absolutely. There was a question also on the chat. You guys yes. mentioned to, uh, the murder of Brandon Tina. It seemed that reports of transgender assaults and murders are more frequently appearing in the media. Do you think that there is actually an increase in violent rates or is it simply a result of increased awareness and reporting? You, you kind of answered stuff um, on the chat, uh, Ryan. Mm -hmm. You said the rates we're seeing could be related both to increased violence and increased awareness. Sadly, the numbers are higher than what we are seeing, and that is true. I mean, yes, there is more visibility, and that could be causing a lot more violence, but I, I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. I think that people are just people, and they're afraid of what's different, and they react violently towards those well, of us who are different. Personal opinion on my on my side, you know, uh, that I think that it's all too often too that it could there could be on, it could be on the rise because there's more trans people coming out. A, um, so there's a lot more of us out there to be targeted uh, than there was before, um, and also the fact that a lot of us try to go stealth and we don't speak up in the initial beginning, and I think. A lot of that pays tribute to a lot of the violence against us as well because we try to hide the fact that we're trans and want to present that we are the gender we're presenting yeah. as. And it doesn't make it right because no violence is right, but yes, I think no. you know, being truthful and upfront because some people do feel deceived and that could create that trigger. But and then there's either the way, other that's, half there's where, no. there's, where there's the violence that occurs when we simply do nothing because yes. somebody looked at us and then they realized, okay, they're trans now, they just had their sexuality question, yeah. so they're going to come after us. It's their own issue, as you said, Ryan. It's not about us. It's stuff that they're dealing with and, and within themselves. Exactly. And we've just become the target, as other members in the LGB community have also been targeted. So exactly. violence is not acceptable, whichever way. Did you want to add on anything else, Ryan, regarding that? Well, just our society with, one, just misogyny. Because when we see the rates of violence, we see the highest rates. Uh, among trans women and women of color. Um, so the misogyny, the homophobia, the transphobia, all those things are combining together to create unsafe environments. And uh, unfortunately, I don't feel that we have enough protections and education among police officers to properly assist and protect people in the transgender community. Well, there is a way we can help prevent that. And it follows within the safety rules. If you're a trans woman, you never go out alone. You always have a friend with you. Um, you know, at least this way, it, it decreases the odds of you getting attacked or being uh, a target, a victim of violence. Um, being people. a large group of other girls, being a large group of people, uh, go out to well-lit, you know, public places. Don't be in... Uh, you know, ghost town type places by yourself. Right, and tell somebody when you're going out with someone that you may not be too comfortable with, just in case you don't check back in, they know, mm -hmm. or something near that nature. But Exactly, yes. so there's a lot of things that we can do to, um, and don't put yourself in vicarious situations. Right, you know, and you were talking about situations. cops in general, I think they need a, a lot of education as well, because we have been targeted by that, too. That, yeah. you know, that... Uh, police force and self have mistreated a lot of transgender people as well so they definitely need a lot of education mm, yes absolutely Any else, anything else you wanted to add anything else you wanted to say um, um, about about violence or no just anything? in general with you and the show <laughs> it's coming to an end we're getting ready to have a show break and then whatever's on your mind yeah whatever's on your mind I was 
<laughs> well, What's I just on you? Uh, well, I want to thank both of you for having the show and having a place where people can speak and share stories and access it wherever you're at in the nation or the world. Uh, I think it's so important, so valuable to have that. And it's also just like uh, Jesse who called in. It's so important for you to not beat yourself up uh, if you feel that you're not in the place where someone else is, because we all have our own separate journeys and our own paths that we need to take. And it's we don't need to be, keep comparing ourselves to other people. This has to be our own path or individual path. So find what's right for you and, and follow it. Exactly. exactly. And don't let the power. Uh, wait, let me see. how. What's that word I'm looking for? Oh, God, I can't remember the. Don't allow the power of suggestion push you beyond your limitations. Exactly. Take baby steps. Do it slowly. Right. And you'll know when it's the right time for you. It's um, a journey, and it's an individual journey. And uh, there's no such thing as not being trans enough. Exactly. You know, and that's a problem I'm finding within our community. There's a lot of elitists, and there's a lot of fighting amongst ourselves. You know, I'm better than you, or you have this, and there's a lot of envy, as you said. And that's just not right, you know. And, we should support one another. We should love one another. We're yes. family. In some way or another, we've all gone through the same struggle. And it hurts me. It irks me to see that. Yes. You know, and then it's just uncalled for. Totally. Well, Ryan, I want to thank you so much thank for you, being Ryan. part of the show. You've been an amazing guest. Um, yes. Well, we'll thank the chatters at the end because we're still going to go. Yeah, and we have a post show if you want to hang out so we can. Yeah, you know. if you can't, we, we understand because we've kept you quite a while but we thank you so much and you've been an amazing yes. guest yes you oh, thank you thank you thank everyone you, for listening too. and we love you love you too love you. <laughs> take care all right so we will be right back within the trans news and the transition video of the week when we return on transition radio tv show stay, stay tuned, tuned. too early. I was sitting there being yeah. stupid. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> he did that on purpose. He saw you being stupid. I know. I so well, Mark was saying. busy. That's why. That's why. <laughs> you should know Joe by now. Well, we are back within the trans news. Yes. Yeah. So before I uh, read a little trans news thing, I want to tell everybody, please visit our website, www.transitionradio.net. Support our sponsor. Support our advertiser. Support our show. We have a little donate button. You could go in and put a little change in there every now and then if you enjoy what we're doing. And uh, we work really hard to bring this show week after week, the radio and TV show. And we've been doing it now over a year and yes. going strong. All right, guys. Yes. The trans news today is trans military documentary seeks to end trans service ban. A new documentary web series seeks to shed light on the U.S. military ban on openly transgender Americans serving in its rank by documenting the lives of several Armed Forces members who are serving in silence. Hosted by producer Fiona Dawson, Trans Military is a six-part new media series documenting the real-life stories of transgender soldiers who are prohibited by military regulation from serving their country and their authentic gender. Ultimately, the project will also create an estimate hour-long documentary about the challenges of serving stealth in the U.S. Armed Forces, in contrast to the United Kingdom, that's Britain, England, a close American ally that has per permitted trans people to serve openly in the military since 1999. U.S. Military Code considers gender dysphoria or any gender-affirming clinical or surgical treatment to be a mental illness that disqualifies a member for service. Allison Robinson, the, the, bleh, the decorated Army veteran who briefly served as the executive director of LGBT service advocacy group OutServe Service Members Legal Defense Network. That's a long name. <laughs> 
has also signed on to the project as a lead consultant along with Alcer former director of communication Zach Stokes, who is an associate producer of the film and director of outreach of Media Matters. I'm Fiona Dawson, your host for Trans Military, a new media series sharing the reality of transgender military lives. <laughs> These heroes, heroines and all in between face stigma and discrimination simply because, like all military personnel, they want to serve the country they love. In the United Kingdom, transgender people have been able to serve in their armed forces since 1999, and yet today, in the United States, despite the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, transgender people are still banned from service. I'm Allison Robinson. I'm a 1994 graduate of West Point, and I served in the Army in Germany and the Middle East and in Korea. I've been a part of the fight for full equality in our military for a long time, and I know that the time is now for transgender people to take the lead in the fight for their right to serve. What is the situation like today for trans people in the military? Well, it's actually even worse than don't ask, don't tell. Anyone whose gender presentation doesn't match up with what the chain of command imagines that it should be or that colleagues imagine that it should be runs the risk of being interrogated in this way. Why is this project so important? Well, it's, it's critically important, Fiona, and it's important right now in this uh, early phase of the fight for a transgender service. Uh, in the same way that it was important for Americans to see images and to hear the voices of gay and lesbian service members uh, early in the fight to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Seeing us, hearing our stories, uh, it, it changes the equation for many people. My name is Bryce Salato. I'm a specialist in the Army National Guard where I serve as a military police soldier. I've been enlisted for over four years now and I'm transgender. What's your earliest memory of being inspired by the uh, military? I would say I was probably like eight or nine years old. Uh, my grandfather was a Marine and he played a really huge part in raising me and, and my childhood. And uh, he was really proud to be a Marine and always talked about his experience in World War II. So, had you considered how you were going to be in the military? Uh, yes and no. So when I still enlisted, um, I, it was 2009, it was February 2009 when I enlisted, so Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still around, and you actually had to sign a piece of paper when I enlisted saying that you wouldn't engage in homosexual conduct. I just enlisted because, you know, I wanted to serve, 9-11 um, really struck with me, and I wanted to carry on my family name in the military. That sounds like an interesting documentary. Yes. Please don't miss it. Uh, it's, uh, you could actually watch the remainder of the, the trailer on Vimeo, and it's called Trans Military, so please um, check it out. Yes, definitely. Running away, hiding in the dark, not wanting to face our inner voice, for being too afraid to face our own reality. Losing, battling, denying who we are seems to be the norm. Is this a curse, or is it a gift? Many still struggle with the choice of this inner beast. Let go, let be, and just allow yourselves to be free. And now for the transition video of the week with Joanna H75.
another amazing transformation. Guys, yes. remember to send us your transition videos to transition radio show at gmail.com. Again, that's transition radio show at gmail.com. Keep them coming. Amazing transformations. Absolutely. Well, Tess and I are embarking on a musical journey. And um, we have what I guess you could call a two man or a two person group called Transcend. We wanted to share with you a song we wrote based on the hatred we received on recent media platform that we were on last week. It was like a media splurge from videos to New York Post mm -hmm. to Daily Mail. Yeah. And it was just amazing thinking we've come such a long way, the hatred that we received, but that will never slow us down. Instead, we wrote a little song here and we wanted to share it with you. The song is called Hate. Hurt. Hurt. I'm sorry. I keep calling it Hate, Hurt, something. I don't even know my song. It's Hurt. <laughs> See, that's why so I have I you in a car. Yeah, one. I heard. <laughs> Let this world come around. 
enjoy it the uh, recording wasn't that great we need to get some better recording equipment because it just kind of sounds but i hope the message of the song was a-okay anyway next week on the radio show we have got kane kane Ann menil she's an arthur and uh actually no ethan robinson i'm sorry we got ethan robinson on the 10th of december when i had myself there and dylan diamond for the tv show We want to thank our chatters. We want yes. to thank our thank viewers. You, thank you, viewers. Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Joe. Joe. Uh, Hi. I feel an echo here. What's <laughs> up? <laughs> anyway. And our callers, too. And our callers. And our callers. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. we're not used to that. Thank you, callers. Thank you so, so much. It's been an amazing show. We thank you and looking forward to next week. Yes, same sir. time, same station, Thursday at 8 p.m. on. Not same time, TV, same station. Transition Radio TV show. <laughs> And we're still on Not Straight TV, Joe, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, All Not right. Straight TV next week. Yeah. Love you guys. Bye love you guys. Remember, remember to always love yourselves, yourselves too. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night.